And as you do that, I'd like to uh, bow our, our heads and our hearts in a word of prayer. Father, we come to you, Lord, and as we um, open your word, Father, and uh, we just pray, God, that we'd get a nugget, we'd get a, a word to speak to our heart to encourage us this morning. A lot of us are going through a lot. A lot of us are hurting in our own ways, fathers, and, and we need to be encouraged, Father, or, or we, we just need to be verified, Father, where we're walking the walk, but we want to keep our eyes focused on you, God. Speak to our hearts, Father, as we look at those who are going to be in the tribulation time and will be martyred, will be killed for standing forth for your word and the testimony, Father, of their faith. And so we just pray, God, that you'd make that real to us this morning in our walk with you. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this morning, again, we're in the book of Revelation, and we're going to be looking at the last seven years on earth as we know it. It's kind of interesting. What will, what, how is the earth going to end? We know. We know what's going to be happening in the last days. That's kind of a heavy-duty thought when you think about that. Prior to Christ coming and establishing his thousand-year reign on the earth, and uh, that was laid out in Daniel 24 through 27. We took a couple weeks um, reading through that. And we saw, though, that in looking in chapter 6, we saw that there were four seals that Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, removed from the scroll that he received from the Father who was on the throne. And if I can pop up that slide there, we realize that the, we call them the four horsemen of the apocalypse, who are well known for. And we saw that as Jesus opened that first seal, that the first horseman came in, and the first horseman came in riding a white horse. And we talked about this first, first horseman that came in that represented the white horse was the Antichrist. And we know the Antichrist not only comes in at this time of the tribulation, but will extend all the way through the great tribulation period, his reign. We know that in the middle of this tribulation period, he's going to declare himself to be God in the temple in Jerusalem and demand that everybody worship him and praise him and receive his mark. We'll talk about that when we get there, but just so you can get a little preview of where we're going. And we talked about all that happened prior to this point in our previous studies. So that is the Antichrist. He's the false Christ. He looks like he could be the real Christ coming out on a white horse, but because he's got a crown, but we talked about that. It's not. It's the Antichrist. Pick up the study, and you can read where we were. Well, then we saw that he's followed by the next slide, and that is going to be the rider who comes in on the red horse. And he's holding a great sword, and he represents the war that's going to be following the coming of the Antichrist. And that's going to be coming on through. The war is going to be continuing. Uh, that's going to be chaotic. <coughs> And it says that he had a great sword. The great sword possibly could be something nuclear, something huge. That's going to call it catastrophic events on the earth. As with most wars, following the war, you have what's called famine. And that is the next one. The next one that comes down is the um, uh, black horse. And that's going to be, thank you, that's going to be representing famine. You see that the rider of the black horse has this scale and he says that a denarius would actually be a whole day weighed with, with what you get for a, a loaf for you to eat of, of wheat, and, or three loaves of barley, which is a grain that wasn't very high quality. So famine always follows wars, and with famine comes malnutrition. You also realize that there's probably going to be an economic collapse that's going to happen because this is going to be a huge worldwide event that's going to be occurring. The rich will always stay the rich. It says the wine and the oil they always have. But for most of the people, the middle class on down, they're going to be dropped out, left out as, as huge famine, pestilence will occur. We then have, following this, the fourth uh, horseman. And the fourth horseman, it says, rides a pale green horse. And that pale green horse actually represents that, that. It says that death followed him, uh, referring to uh, death and the grave followed him. Talking about those that didn't receive the Lord at this time and that died would have eternal damnation. It says that one-fourth, one-fourth of the world's population will be destroyed. Now that's kind of a heavy-duty thought when you think about that. One-fourth that's going to be actually killed, it said, by the sword, by hunger, and by the beasts of this world, that's going to kill one-fourth the population. If we have seven million people, half of that is three and a half million, and half of that is one point, excuse me, three and a half, three and a half, three and a half billion, thank you, a couple decimal points. 
And then 1.75 billion is one fourth of that total amount. 1.75 billion. I mean, if a nuclear bomb hits uh, a place of huge population, plus a famine, and one of the things that we th that really kind of hit my heart was. <coughs> You see all these movies about all this pestilence or this infectious pandemic, worldwide infection that could break out. We're always worried about something breaking down in Africa or coming off. We live in a we live in a day where something can spread. We know overnight now through the airlines, and if something viral or bacterial, some beast that got through, it could have a huge devastation upon the earth. So this morning we're going to be finishing, not finishing up, we're going to hit really one more seal, the fifth seal in the book of Revelation, and we're going to see um, what's going to be happening. But before we hit the fifth seal, <clears throat> I want to stop and reflect on where we are today. So in looking at this next slide, hopefully this, those of you that have been coming each week, this might look somewhat familiar to you. You should be able to look at this and put this in connection. But for those of you that haven't been, let me just take a second and kind of review we talked about that prior to the seven-year period, the period that we're living in today, this is known as the what? The church age. That was the age of when Christ was crucified, and beyond that, we have it that it was, it was actually, um, uh, Jerusalem was destroyed and burned, and that's the time that we're living in right now. We're living in the church age. Chapter 2 and chapter 3 of the book of Revelation speaks of the church age. Following the church age, we're going to have what? the rapture of the church. Well, we're not raptured right now. So we're talking about these tribulation periods that's going to come after the rapture of the church, and that's going to happen over a period of seven years. With the great tribulation that the world has never seen happening halfway through. Now you stop and you think, oh, that's going to be greater than what we just heard about, one-fourth the world population dying. The answer is yes. Next week we're going to look at the catastrophic, world catastrophic events that's going to happen. I have a couple clips that I want to show you that are pretty remarkable about what it means for us today. Things that have happened recently and are expected to happen in California and the western coast and different things with earthquakes that are being predicted um, and some videos that, that support that. But I want to talk about a section about where we are today because we're living in a time um, that was spoken of in 1 Timothy 4. And it says in 1 Timothy 4, it says, now the Spirit, it, can I have the next slide there? Yeah, there you go. I think you got that set up as a backdrop there. It says, now the Spirit expressly says that in the latter times, some will depart from the faith, giving hear, heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. We're living right now in these latter times. So I'm going to talk about before the rapture occurs right now, because that's the relevance of where we are. We're living right now in these latter times, in these last days, before the second coming of Jesus Christ, before the tribulation period, before even the first seal is broken and we see the Antichrist coming. Before that happens, it says that there's going to be a rebellion, an apostasy of the truth of God. I truly believe, and I'm going to share why this morning, that we're living in these last days the days that talks about the church of Laodicea, the lukewarm days where Christ wants to spit most of the church out of his mouth because they aren't hot or cold. They're not refreshing or, or, or to, to any aspect of the world that we should be. We should be the sixth church, the church of Philadelphia. It says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, 3, and 4, let no one deceive you by any means. God does not want us to be, see, to be deceived. For that day will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God and that is worship, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. You need to realize that this scripture talks about the church age all the way through the middle of of when the Antichrist sets himself up to be God. I want to show you that. Make sure you understand this, this scripture. Uh, Lee, put, put it back up there. It says that, <clears throat> Do not be deceived, for the day will not come, that means the day of Jesus Christ's return, unless there first comes a falling away. So before Jesus Christ's second return, there has to be a falling away. An apostasia. That's the Greek word where we get the word what? Apostasy. And when that falling away comes first, then the man of sin is going to be revealed. Who's the man of sin? The Antichrist. Who's the son of perdition? 
the Antichrist, who opposes and exalts himself above all, that halfway through the tribulation period, three and a half years into it, he's going to demand that he becomes worship and is going to sit himself in the temple of God that will now be built again, the third temple, as we've talked about for several weeks, that still has to be built. So that hasn't been done yet. And so we see we're living in this time that there has to be a falling away first before that first seal is open, before that Antichrist comes riding in. The word falling away actually means apostasy, like I said, and it means, the Greek word means a rebellion, an abandonment, a forsaking, a defection from, or a falling away. In fact, if you have the New King James, it actually has falling away, but if you have an NIV or an English Standard Version, an ESV, it doesn't say falling away. It actually says a rebellion. And the reason it says the rebellion is because that's what apostasy is. And apostasy is a rebellion of the truth. It's a falling away from the truth. It's an abandonment of the truth. And in the end times, that's what we're going to see. We're going to see a rejection that we're in right now to the truth of God, to the truth of the Word of God, to the Christian faith and its tenets of what it believes, the virgin birth of what it believes, is of realizing that Christ is the only way for salvation. Today, one of the most popular apostasy, one of the most popular false teaching, is that God has revealed himself in many different ways and in many different cultures. So, it doesn't matter what God you worship, we all worship what? The same God. So if you worship Allah, the false teaching says, that's the same thing as as you worshiping Yahweh because there's only one God and we just call him by different names has anybody ever told you that that's kind of a teaching out there that there's one God it doesn't matter we all worship and this worldly conclusion from this apostate idea from this falling away idea from this rebellious idea is that there's many different paths to God I'm going to share a few things with you <clears throat> There is a, a very liberal uh, group called the National Council of Churches in the United States and the World Council of Churches. They've actually, this group has condemned missionary activity because they call it arrogant. They call it being anti-cultural. In other words, why would you want to go share in a Muslim country if we all worship what? The same God. That's pretty arrogant of you. So obviously they think they know what truth is. And this group, in fact, a meeting was convened. Um, there's been steps to establish a unified world religion. In June of 1997, over 200 delegates from religious groups all over the world gathered at Stanford University, this is 97, and began drafting a charter for International Interfaith Institute, and it's called the Organization of United Religions. Now, this was 20 years ago. The meeting was convened and presided over by a Reverend William Swing, who is an Episcopal Bishop of San Francisco. Swing founded the United Religious Initiative as a model for the United Nations. Since 1993, he has been traveling worldwide to set up a network of religious leaders interested in a one-world religious organization. In 1996, he traveled to China, Japan, South Korea, India, the Middle East, and Europe, seeking guidance and commitment from leaders of many different religions, including the Buddhist Dalai Lama, Mother Teresa, Hinduism, Shankaracharya, Islam's Grand Mufti, and the Archbishop of Canterbury. He told the San Francisco Chronicle, I spent a lot of times praying with the Brahmins, meditating with the Hindus, and chanting with Buddhists. I feel I've been enormously enriched inwardly by exposure to these folks. I've gone back and read our own scriptures, and it's amazing how they begin to read differently when you're exposed to more truth from more people in other parts of the world. Isn't that just amazing? All of a sudden, these influences start influencing you. Many people believe that what's called the ecumenical church is now here and alive and will probably be the major persecutions of Christians from this point forward. And definitely what's going to be probably happening in America. <clears throat> 
Ecumenism, and let me explain what that means. Ecumenism can be defined as a movement that promotes worldwide unity among religions through greater cooperation. Now, that in itself doesn't sound too bad. However, this is what they mean. A Christian priest might invite a Muslim imam to come in here and to speak at his pulpit. Or we might want to go to a, a Hindu temple and then all pray together. See the whole perspective? We all are worshiping what? One God. All paths lead to the same God. And it's definitely wrong. We're not to yoke ourselves together with unbelievers at all. Light and darkness have no fellowship with each other. Today, this movement is shown in a very popular bumper sticker you may have seen. It's called Coexist. How many have seen that? Now, leave it up there for a second. If you've got somebody next to you, explain some of those symbols to that person really quick. Pretty enlightening, huh? In your own conversations there. I mean, after all, don't we all want to coexist? Don't we all want to just get along, hold hands? Why can't we be friends? Kumbaya. Hit the next slide. How many had the first one right? Islam, all right. That's the crescent moon of Islam. The peace sign, how many had that right? Male, female, here we have co-gender. Every aspect involved, it's all there. Judaism, here you have Wicca, paganism. Taoism, Confucianism, and Christianity. You see this whole feeling that we're all just moving through and we're all going to end up the whole idea. They say they claim tolerance, promoting the end of discrimination against all religions, as well as all discriminations, because it appears very non-threatening. But <clears throat> they believe that if we have an absolute truth, that our way is correct, then we're very closed-minded. In fact, they believe that there is no absolute truth or beliefs, but that all beliefs are the same and claim that we all worship the same God. <clears throat> I disagree. I believe that there are absolute truths in this world. I believe firmly that if you throw an apple up, what's going to happen? Gravity's going to pull it down. Those are gravitational laws that exist in our world. I truly believe one plus one equals what? Two. There's mathematical laws that we, that we plan on that our life exists constantly in every aspect that we live in. I truly believe in the second law of thermodynamics, which is called the law of entropy. The law of entropy says everything goes from a state of order to what? Disorder. Just look at your garage. <laughs> look at your body. Unless, unless constructive energy with a plan is put into the system. You see, biologically, we have DNA. And as we eat food, and that DNA, which is a plan that God has placed in our bodies, and as we eat food, it breaks down and makes um, ATP and the energy and we're able to go constructively, positively, because there's constructive energy with the plan. If you put a fire to your body, although that's energy, that's not going to do you any help. So there are certain physical laws that we live by, and the truth is there are certain spiritual laws that direct our lives and that guide our lives every single time. In fact, if you think we're closed-minded, listen to the words of Jesus Christ. He said, enter by the what? Narrow gate. For wide is the great, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many that go by it. Because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. And then in that context, look at the next verse. Beware of what? False prophets. In the context of saying that I am the way, the truth, and the life, that no one comes to the Father but through me, that there's a narrow gate. He then says, beware of false teachers. Beware of somebody 
giving you a prophetic word that everyone can enter in all through one gate. I believe the word of God is truth. I believe that Jesus Christ is truth. The reality is that the coexist belief system, I'll call it, believes that no one religion is an absolute truth, and they absolutely believe this. You got that? It's crazy. They hold an absolute belief that declares there's no what? Absolute truths. And they absolutely believe that. So if you disagree, then you're very intolerant. Do you see the spin? It happens the fact that they are the now the ones that are intolerant because we don't agree with their belief that everything is the same. That we're all going to one God. And you must be wrong. So therefore, I absolutely believe this, so it's truth. And now you can't have a conversation with anyone anymore. And that has kind of shut down. But most coexist believers do not consciously realize that their whole perspective is illogical. It actually is self-contradictional as an absolute belief to declare that there's no absolute belief. It makes no sense whatsoever. Because they think that they know it all and they will tell us what truth is and to disagree with them is non-tolerance, welcome to apostasy 2017. Welcome to the world that you and I now live in. And you might say, well, that's great that these people feel there, but it's not really affecting the other world, is it? I mean, it's not affecting people who are that close-minded to us having our own belief system and holding our own belief system. Here's a soundbite from 2014, three years ago, from the mayor at that time of New York. Uh, Andrew Cuomo, uh, who uh, Andrew is Cuomo, the governor uh, of New York, had some the governor interesting of New York comments. Had some I would say it was almost like partisan comments. cleansing. I would say it was almost like partisan about cleansing, cleansing about conservatives or extremists. Uh, conservatives, conservatives or extremists, as he calls uh, in New York State. Listen to this. Uh, in New York State, listen to this. Their problem is not me. Their and problem the is not me. And the their Democrats, problem is themselves. Their problem is themselves. Who are they? Who are, are they, these they? Extreme are they these extreme conservatives who are right to life, right to a life, pro assault, a weapon, pro assault weapon, anti gay, anti gay? Is that who they are? Is that who because they if are? Because that's who they are, because if that's and if they who they are, the are and if they are the extreme conservatives, they have no place in the state of New York. They have no place in the so state of New York. That's not who New so Yorkers so are. That's not who New Yorkers do, are. Do you guys catch that? I mean, it's not to the point where politically, if you if you believe in the Second Amendment, the right to bear arms. If you believe that you want to have a voice for the child who's killed in the womb who has no voice, if you believe that the marriage should be between a man and a woman only, then you're not welcome in New York because that's not who New Yorkers are about. You're just wrong. You're just bad people. That has now entered, that's the world that we are before the Antichrist has come. You got that? The falling away, the apostasy, and before the first seal is even open, that's where we are today. You're not welcomed. In other words, we will accept all perspectives except those who don't share our perspectives. That's just the way it is. Make no mistake, Allah and Yahweh are not the same God. The Christian God is a triune being. Allah is a single individual entity. Allah is not the God of the Bible. Allah, <clears throat> excuse me, the church is people gathered from all tongues, from all nations, from all tribes, from all, all peoples. Jesus Christ came and bore our sins, and he sends us to preach the gospel of grace and the forgiveness of sins based on his death on the cross. See, what unites us is what Jesus Christ did on the cross. Not our ethnic background, not our political perspectives, but our faith in Jesus Christ. We're not here to build an earthly kingdom. We're not here to protect an ethnic identity. As Christians, we're here to gather whoever you are, all nations, all people. In fact, we're called to love our enemies, right? To die for our enemies. God has changed our lives. Allah, however, rewards only good deeds. And unlike the God of the Bible, there's no way in that belief system to redeem the loss. Muslim doesn't have the saviors. They don't have a Christ. They don't have a means of forgiveness. In fact, they actually deny the cross of Christ ever even occurred. They simply have an, author an authoritative God who says, do this and do that. Can I pop up the next slide? 
And I think the naivety that we have in this world is that we're all going to get along. What they don't realize is their whole desire is to take over the what? The world. They think their whole perspective is to do that. But whether it's going to be through infiltration or through jihad, that not is what their perspective is. And, you know, the Christian God delights in saving sinners. All it wants to destroy sinners. Well, after the rapture of the church, this falling away is going to continue to move forward and be complete and to become worldwide, even to the point that in the middle of the tribulation period, those that do not declare the Antichrist as being God or the image that he sets up will have to give their life. With that, let's look at chapter 6, verse 9. It says that when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holding in true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Well, then a white robe was given to each of them, and it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer, until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren, who would be killed as they were, was completed. So now we see that Jesus Christ comes, and as he opened the first four seals of the scroll and those were the apocalypse right the four horsemen the fifth one was a little bit different when he opened the fifth one john saw their altar up in heaven and under the altar there were the souls of those who were slain for the word of god and for the testimony so people ask the question will people be saved during the tribulation period the answer is what Yes, scripturally, you have a place you can show somebody. For sure, people will be saved. In fact, there's a special place for those martyred under this altar. What is this altar, some people ask? Well, different commentators believe this could be like an altar of incense, representing the prayers of the saints, as we've seen the saints' prayer. Some people say, no, I think it's going to be like a sacrificial altar, because these people have, what, sacrificed their lives. I'm not too sure. You can do your own research and come to whatever conclusion you want. But it is, there's a special altar for these people. And it's not with the church. The church are the 24 elders. So there's a whole different perspective. And it says that those who die, though, are going to be directly going to heaven. <clears throat> in other words, their souls are located right there under the altar in heaven. <clears throat> it says that they were slain because of the word of God. The word slain is a pretty graphic term. It actually means to slaughter, to butcher, or to kill by a violent death, to slay. And it says that they were slain because of the word of God. In other words, the reason that they died is because they had, just like we, we hold fast to the truth that the word of God is the truth, right? We live in this world that we just talked about where apostasy is coming across, and if you have that belief, it's the only way, then my goodness, you must be crazy. And your beliefs are crazy. And these people are killed just for believing in the Word of God. Angela and I have been going through uh, the book of Nehemiah together. And we were hitting this passage and we were just sharing. I just, I just, it just kind of jumped out just what this means. The Nehemiah, as, as we had talked about before, that on March 14th, 445 B.C., um, King Artaxerxes of Persia gave the decree that, that Jerusalem and that the city, the walls, should be rebuilt. We talked about that before. And Nehemiah was the cupbearer to, the cup bearer to King Artaxerxes. And it was on his heart to go all the way back from Babylon, travel 800 miles all the way back to Jerusalem, and to start building the wall around the city. Now the temple was already rebuilt. <clears throat> Ezra was already there, and there was a temple. And so Nehemiah went back, and when he arrived, after he started building, he built the walls that said, and it lasted 52 days. So the walls are all built, but then we come to chapter 8, and I'd like to read a few verses from chapter 8 of Nehemiah. It says, Now all the people gathered together as one man in the open square that was in the front of the water gate, and they told Ezra the scribe to bring in the law, the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded Israel. So Ezra, and Ezra was the priest, and they have the, the second um, temple is now built. He brought the law before the assembly of the men and the women and all who could understand the first day of the seventh month. So it's now the first day of the seventh month. 
<clears throat> and he brings out the book of the law of Moses to read to them. And you've got to realize, every person there were never there when the first temple was built. They were either born in captivity or maybe they then came to Jerusalem and they were born in Jerusalem. They've never heard the word of God proclaimed. A lot of times back probably in Babylon, it was just kept for the priests there. They probably met still as Jewish groups, but now they proclaimed in a whole group. And it says in verse 5 that Ezra opened the book in the sight of the people because he was standing above the people, probably like a little platform like this. And as he opened it and all the people stood up and Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, then all the people answered, Amen, Amen, while lifting up their hands. And they bowed their heads all the way down and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. And also, a whole bunch of these people and the Levites helped the people, I like this, to understand the law. And the people stood in their places. So they read distinctly from the book of the law of God, and they gave the sense and help them to understand the reading. That's what we're doing this morning, right? We have these little cards that you guys pass out. In the bottom left, it says, simply teaching the Word of God simply. If you want to pray something for Brad Roberts, pray that he learns how to simply teach the Word of God simply. That's my desire. Because if you guys can leave here with a good, a good spiritual meal, you know what I mean? A nugget or two, that's going to take you on through as you continue to read the Word of God yourself. And it was interesting that here are these people, God puts upon the house to say, do these people really understand what they're hearing? And they're now teaching these people. And it says he helped them and gave them understanding. Verse 9, and Nehemiah, who was the governor, the governor, I thought he was a cupbearer. Nehemiah went from being a cupbearer to being the head of a construction team to now being what? Governor of this city as God exalted him. <clears throat> and Ezra the priest and the scribes and the Levites who taught the people said to the period, this is a day holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn for all the people wept when they heard the words of the Lord. Praise God. Their hearts got stirred. Their hearts got broken. They were just probably from conviction or weeping out loud because they got to hear God's word. They love to hear God's word. Do you guys love to hear God's word? Do you desire to hear God's word? You've got to realize those people were killed during the tribulation period because they held fast to what? The word of God. It says in verse 13 now, now on the second day, well, that's interesting, the second day, the very next day, the heads of the fathers' houses of all the people, so the priests of the fathers, the men came with the priests and the Levites, and they were gathered with Ezra the scribe in order to what? Understand the words of the law. I want to understand the words of the law so I can apply it to my life. I've got to find some meaning and some application. And they found written in the law, which the Lord has commanded by Moses, that the children of Israel should dwell in booths during the feast of the seventh month, which is the Feast of Tabernacles. I think one of my favorite things about having my quiet times or doing a study time is when I find a nugget in the Word of God. Who knows what I mean? You're reading through the Word of God and all of a sudden you kind of go, Wow, God just spoke to my heart. He just gave me a word of encouragement. He just spoke, he, wow, that's a nugget. And they're reading through this and they found, they discovered, wait a second. It says that we're supposed to be dwelling in booths during this feast. We're supposed to be taking these branches and setting these branches up and making little tiny huts and then getting inside these huts because that's what they did during the Feast of Tabernacles. And it has been neglected to make these booths, we're going to find out, since the time of Joshua after they entered into the Promised Land. They celebrated the Feast of Tabernacles, but they didn't get with their family. And they didn't crawl into these little tiny huts on top of their houses and say, hey, do you know why we're here? We're here to remember what God did when he took the people from Egypt. You know that they were in slavery in Egypt and then they left Egypt? And you know who directed them? God did. You know who provided for them? God them. You know who led them ever and, and took care of them and provided shelter and food and made sure that their sandals didn't wear out? God did. You know why that's necessary? So those families could huddle together and have that God of the Bible be a personal God to them. And I was looking at that and saying, do we do that? Do you do that? This morning we had our grand boys with us. 
<clears throat> and they went back to go to church with, with their mom and dad. And Ansel and I opened up and we we're continuing in Nehemiah in chapter 9. And Caleb goes, well, you guys read that a lot. <laughs> you, guys, you guys are really into that, aren't you? I said, yeah, I yeah, am. We are. We do. We like to read the Word of God. We like to see what God wants to speak to us as a couple besides our quiet time. We want to see what God has for us. And I like to dialogue, to have a sister in the Lord or a brother at some time for a cup of coffee or to see what God... That's what is exciting. The Word of God. And those people were killed. They were persecuted. They died. They were slain. A, a death just because of the Word of God. And it continues and it says in verse 15 that they should announce and proclaim in all their cities in Jerusalem saying go out in the mountains bring in the olive branches the branches of oil trees and myrtle branches and palm branches and branches of leafy trees to make these little tiny huts booths as it is written. Then, then you know what? All the people went out and they did what God's word said. They read God's word. Oh yeah. We should be doing this in our lives. We should be doing this as a family. You know what? Let's do it. Right? To know God's word, but to apply God's word are two separate things too, huh? I know God's word said to do this, but now I got to what? Do this. I got to step out. I got to lead my family. I got to get up early in the morning. I got a purpose in my heart that that's going to be a priority in my personal life to spend time with Jesus Christ. <clears throat> 16, then the people went out and brought themselves and made themselves booths, each one on the roof of their house. That's what Jewish people had. The patios were the roof on top of their house. If they didn't have a house, then on their courtyards or the courts of the house of God or in the open square at the water gate or in the open square at the gate of Ephraim. So the whole assembly and those who had returned from the captivity made booths and sat under the booths since the days of Joshua and Nun, for since the days of Joshua, the son of Nun, until the day the children of Israel hadn't made these booths. They haven't done so. And there was very great gladness. And so also day by day, from the first day until the last, they read from the book of the law of God and they kept the feast for seven days. You need to realize that as you listen to God's word and as you obey God's word, it's always going to result in great gladness. There will never be a time where I said, God, the word says to do this. I'm going to apply that in my life. And when I step out by faith and it really may not make sense to me or it's hard for me or it changes my schedule because I'm a real selfish person and I do it and I obey God's word, I'm always glad. There's never a time when ah, I'm so disappointed that I followed God's word. <laughs> it's never happened. I'm always blessed beyond, just totally blessed. <clears throat> And besides being slain for the word of God, it says that they were slain for the testimony that they maintain. The third testimony actually is <clears throat> martyria, where we get the word what? Martyr. Is that what I mean? Their witness means they were martyred. They were killed for the testimony that they held. The witness they maintained. It was their story. It was their story. What's your story? What's your testimony? <clears throat> in other words, their story walked the walk. They walked their talk. Their lifestyle aligned with the Word of God. There wasn't any hypocrisy. And I would say, what's your story? Well, Bill and I were talking, and we thought, wouldn't it be great if we took the different people here and we videotaped what their story was? And we shared a person's testimony on Sunday morning. A little three-minute for all of us to hear. How God has changed your testimony. I made up a little flyer when you come in. We didn't stuff them. But if you ever wanted to say, well, Brad, what do you mean by testimony? What I mean is, and it's written up pretty here, is what was your like before you encountered Jesus? How did you meet Jesus? And then what difference has following Jesus made in my life? Pretty simple, huh? Where was I before? How did I meet him? And how has God changed me? And we have a little flyer here. If you want to take it home, you can sit down and say, hey, let me write your notes, and you write my notes, and share. Because I'd love it if you guys do that. Do you know that when Tammy <coughs> gets involved in missionary groups, <coughs> or those of us that have been on the mission fields, if you've done a DTS or if you've done that, a lot of times the first thing they have you do is to write your what? Testimony. Because nobody can disagree what God has done in your life. They can't say, well, he hasn't done that in your life. What do you mean? I was dead, now I'm alive. I was in a life of sin, and he cleaned that areas up in life. He took my life that was a mess, 
and he made it whole. In fact, God likes making beauty from ashes. He's in the business of reconciliation. He's in the business of reconstruction. And just as the wall was built around the city, these people's walls now had to be built in their individual lives in the time of Nehemiah. And the only way to build your wall up in your life is through God's word. And these people were being slain because of the testimony that they gave. And then it says in verse 10 that they cried out with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth, on these earth dwellers? Kind of a heavy-duty thought when you think the souls are going to say, God, give them vengeance. Kill them, God! How long is it going to be until justice occurs? But have you seen that not in your life? Some injustice goes by, maybe something political happens, and you see it, and it's glaring, and you go, why doesn't some justice occur in our country? Why doesn't somebody stand up and give them what they deserve? Because there's a time for justice. But the only one who can really administer true justice is one who is holy and true and is the sovereign Lord. Because if I administer vengeance, I'm going to get involved with it. There'll be a lot of brad in that vengeance. You know, I've often thought, if someone was to kill my child or kill my grandchildren, I tell you what, you guys would have to pray for me. Because there's a part of Brad, I'm just being honest with you, that would want vengeance. I would want to go out and take care of the matter myself. I'm just telling you. And it'd have to be a work of the Lord. And I know he's capable of doing it. And I pray that I would just submit my life totally and say, God, you are holy and just. And justice and vengeance belongs to you. But how long, O Lord? How long? And that's what these guys that were praying, they're crying out. Now, it's interesting. Do you notice? They didn't lose their memory. That's a thought. How long, O Lord? They still realize that something was done wrong to them, right? I want to read another scripture to you in Luke 16, 19 through 31. It says, There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every single day. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, and he laid at his gate, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. This is Luke 16, verse 19. So it was that the beggar died... <clears throat> Excuse me. Moreover, the dogs came and they licked the sores. So it was that when the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom, that the rich man also died and was carried and was buried. And being in torment in Hades, he, that's the rich man, lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off, and Lazarus was in his bosom. And he cried out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send, and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in the water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in these flames. But Abraham said, Son, you remember that in your lifetime you received good things, and likewise Lazarus received evil things, but now he is comforted and you are tormented. The point I want to bring this. He told Lazarus, he said, You what? Remember. You remember, son, that in your life you received what? Good things. I'm I'm just sharing there's some scriptural aspect that when you die, you don't forget all aspects of maybe aspects of this life or areas that God wants us to remember. I just thought that was a real interesting scripture. Then it says in verse 11 that a white robe was given to each one of them and he said to them that they should rest a little while longer until the number of their fellow servants of the brethren would be killed <clears throat> as they were, was completed. Here's another thought that I was interested in. He says to wait a little while, what? <clears throat> Longer. That's a concept of time. To wait means you have to understand there's a concept of what? Time. I thought people that died were outside the concept of time. I don't know. I just, just something to think about, right? To kind of ponder. They still have the concept of time. He says, wait a little while longer until the number of the fellow servants of the brethren would be killed. And it was completed. So often we think this picture that what's going to happen when we're going to be die? Are we going to forget every single aspect of life? I don't think we will, based on the scripture. Are we going to live outside the concept of time? I'm not too sure, based upon some of these scriptures. 
But we do know that God's going to be the one who's going to avenge our blood, for those of us who die, onto the earth dwellers. And it said they should wait a little while longer. I don't know if that's the answer I would want to hear from God, that I should wait. I like things to be done now. I want vengeance to be done now. And he said, wait until longer, until what? All the people die that I've appointed to die. Isn't that a heavy-duty thought? In other words, are these the only people that are going to die for the Lord in the tribulation period? No. It says there's still going to be time when other people are going to die for the Lord in the tribulation period. Throughout the tribulation period, people are going to die. In fact, some people believe that the tribulation period will be the greatest revival that has ever occurred, and we're going to look in chapter 7 to see probably the context of why that happened, and maybe chapter 14 also. See, in the tribulation period, you're going to have two choices, either to accept Jesus Christ or to reject Jesus Christ, and they're both going to have incredible consequences. If you accept Jesus Christ, then you're going to face the consequence of death here on earth at the hands of the Antichrist. But you will have eternity forever in heaven and be with Christ and the Father. But to reject Jesus Christ <clears throat> means you're going to face the wrath of God, and we're going to see that really coming down next week on earth and then throughout eternity. <clears throat> it's clear that there will not be just these martyrs in heaven, but other people. Hit up the last slide there. So as we look, we're going to see that the martyrs that come that are under the altar will also be added continuing on through the tribulation period, I believe. So what does that mean? Think of all the friends that you witnessed to. Think of all the friends that think that you are crazy, that you've joined a cult, that think that you are just off in never, never land. And then think about it when all of a sudden one day you're not there because you've been raptured. I really believe that those people that know you, that have been hearing you, God's going to get their attention. And then when the Antichrist starts establishing his reign, my prayer is they're going to have enough wisdom to receive the Lord and to resist him and the mark. Because to receive that would be would be eternal damnation. I stop and I wonder and think, well, how are they going to hear it when the church is gone? You come to my house, there's going to be Bibles all over the place. You got MP3s, MP4s. Take this lesson, put it in a CD or on a flash drive, and put it in your living trust. Put it in your living will. Put it someplace that says, in case you think that aliens just took my body. Please listen to this clip. Because that's what they're going to think's happened, right? They're going to believe in everything else, every apostasy, every false doctrine. Revelation makes one point very clear. Death is not the worst event. Living and dying without Christ is the worst thing that anyone can happen. Guys, if you've never asked Jesus Christ, to be your Lord and Savior, I pray that you would yield your life and ask him tonight. And if you're listening on tape and you've never done that or you're at home, I pray that you receive Jesus Christ now while it's easy and the consequences are that great because there's going to be a time when the consequence will be immediate death once you proclaim Christ. Let's pray. Father, we come to you, Lord, and we do ask you, Father, that you'd work on our hearts, that you stir our hearts, Father, to have our life aligned with your words, Father, to, to be strong on your behalf, Father, to love the word, to eat the word daily, Father, to look for those nuggets, God. But I pray if there's somebody here who's never asked Jesus Christ into their heart to be their Lord and Savior, and they want to have the assurance of salvation to look up now, put up your hand. Is there anyone here this morning? Is there anyone here who just wants some special prayer this morning? They're having a hard time, and they want us as a church body to pray for you. Yes, brother. Is anybody else? Look up. Thank you, sis. Thank you, brother, right here. Thank you in the middle. Thank you, guys. Thank you, sis, right here. Anybody else? Thank you back there, guys. Thank you. Thank you, bro. Thank you very much in the middle. Thanks. Thanks, sis. Thank you, sister. Well, let's pray. 
God, we lift up the body, Father. We pray for one another. Thank you for the love that we have for one another. Lord, I pray that we always are filled with your love and your grace for every person in this body. God, that there's never <clears throat> a feeling of superiority, but only that of humility because of all that you've done for our lives. God, I pray for those that are going through a difficult time, that are going through a transition. God, that you would just uh, fill their lives, Father. Answer their prayers, God. Draw them closer unto you. And Lord, if you spoke to their heart, Father, have them be obedient to what you've spoken. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you guys. Have a great day.